fact, I can't think of anyone better in the world, perhaps, to open with what we call a panel keynote. This is someone who sets a tone and has a solo stage for a little bit to talk about the topic. In this case, Raghu Krishnamurthy is clearly one of the leaders in the space of executive education. Our own dean, Sally Blount, mentioned a few years ago to me when she first started, I think a lot of the most innovative things happening in executive education aren't happening at business schools. Uh, Kellogg excluded, of course. <laughs> but they're happening in corporations. They're happening at places like Crotonville. And if you're in the executive ed space, Crotonville is nearly a location of pilgrimage, and Raghu is the guru. So with that, I'd love to, I'm happy to introduce you to Raghu Krishnamurti. Thank you very much. Now, despite the flat, flattering introduction, I'm just the warm-up act before the main show. Um, you know, we speak about education and development. In my opinion, as a business professional, that's just an input. At the end of the day, Organizations, corporations are more bothered about talent and leadership. So when we look at education and development, we need to view that through the lens of what does it mean for talent and leadership, the two most important variables for anything to do with innovation. So what I'm going to do is clip through a few main themes that in GE we are wrestling with as we look at the next generation of talent and development and what it means for us in terms of education. So let me start by saying that the realization for GE is that we are in 171 countries, 330,000 employees across eight to 10 different businesses. Therefore, the aha for us as we look at the data, it's something that McKinsey actually came up with, is the fact that we now live in a multimodal world, and as the world grows smaller, actually it grows quite different too. So you have countries that have skills surplus, and skills deficit. And then you have countries that have people surplus and people deficit. Okay? Now, in this category, and I'm, I know you will argue with me whether there is actually enough skills in the US or not, but you have US, Japan, Germany, UK, many, many of the Western world where you're starting to see this, the people shortage happening but the skill surplus still remains, at least in terms of core skills. And the biggest challenge for us is how do I replenish this talent with a new set of talent as the people start retiring and moving on. So the whole thing here is replenishment. And it's about knowledge transfer. It's about making sure you start building new capabilities, for instance, manufacturing. For a couple of generations in the US, you lost the art of manufacturing. It was all outsourced. Now it's coming back. 3D printing, additive manufacturing, what does that mean? So this is all about replenishment. Then you have countries where you have people surplus and skill surplus, at least for the moment, places like China, India, and so on and so forth. Of course, many of the folks who are from China and India come to Kellogg, go back. Uh, and when they go back, they basically are now having the skills that we would want to keep here, but they are actually benefiting those countries. It's great. The biggest issue we here we have is retention. But also, how do I tap the energy and the innovativeness of this group, because they are very hungry. Then you have an entire category here, primarily in many parts of Africa and some parts of Latin America and some parts of A Asia as well, where you have skill shortage and people shortage. In some places, you have people surplus, Nigeria is for, for instance, but skills shortage. And there you may almost have to go ground up, like what Jeff was mentioning, how do I go to universities and schools and start building talent ground up? So this is the challenge we are facing with reference to how we are looking at talent across the world when we have to think through talent in 171 countries. The second thing we are realizing is, and this speaks to what Anna said in terms of orbits, here is where leadership is, and here is where the market is. Especially for the Fortune 500 companies, most of the leadership and headquarters are here, while well, the market and the action is happening here. For instance, in case of GE, 24 countries produce more than a billion dollars in terms of revenue. And some of these countries include Algeria, Angola, Vietnam, Indonesia. Indonesia is still okay. But talk about the fact that we want expats not to go to London, Paris, Hong Kong, Sydney, but to go to Angola, Mozambique, Algeria. Who would want to go there? So this is one. The second issue we have is, this is if leadership is here, this is where power is. 
And that actually has a problem with reference to ideas and innovations. Actually, we are starting to see that much of uh, innovation happening in these markets, for instance, in Africa, the entire con continent bypassed, the, um, bypassed and went straight to the mobile technology. How do we bring innovations from this part of the world here when leadership and power center and, um, is here and people here don't necessarily have the receptivity or broadness of thinking that it takes to ensure that we tap into the energies and innovations from every part of the world. The third element that we are grappling with is uh, what Josh Burson came up with, saying that if you look at learning, most of us are used to learning in the classroom, okay, log included, wherever it is, which is an event-based setup, right? You come into a classroom, there is a spike in learning, and then you go back a little bit uh, and rest and so on. With the world opening up in terms of technology, how do we build and enhance and supplement and substitute in some cases with the technology using the wide canvas of learning opportunity that is there today? And as we look at this, the fundamental shift for us is for a long time at GE, learning and development was a privilege, right? If you are great, you go to Crotonwell. However, as we look at the evolution of the world, for us it's a deep appreciation of the fact that learning is actually a necessity. Development can still be a privilege, which means now we are starting to look at what does a classroom of one look like? What does do, what personal, personally customized learning opportunity look like? And how do we make sure we leverage technology going forward to create groundbreaking breaking learning that's appropriate to filter through 330,000 employees who cannot all come to a classroom in person? So what does that look like? So these are the challenges we have on the talent world, which we are trying to grapple with. Now, the next set of thoughts are around leadership. As we look at what do we need to do with reference to a talent, uh, with reference to talent, we also need to figure out what does it mean for leadership. The few ahas that we've already spoken about is if you just look at this century, and look at the fact that we started the century with the dot-com bubble, then the 9-11, then you had the Iraq war, then you had the tsunami, Katrina, then of course you had the big problem with reference to the housing bubble and the recession, and even today you have something like the Ukraine crisis, which is all integrated. So the thing that we are looking at is the magnitude of changes happening are something that we have never bargained for before. The kind of changes happening businesses have not seen before. The unpredictability of changes happening is also something that we have not recognized before. So what it means is in some ways, the only continuity is the discontinuity. As they say, the nature of change has changed. So we are talking about continuous, continuous discontinuity. Right? So this is one phenomenon we, we are facing. The second phenomenon we are facing is a, gen, a generational differential, and we speak about that all the time, but let's take somebody who's 60 years old, a male, and a 30-year-old male, for the sake of argument, nothing um, prejudicial about this, just for the sake of argument. Formative years, maybe in the army, but for all you know, the formative years, formative uh, experiences could be trekking through Ladakh and Nepal and, and so on and so forth, right? Then this person says, okay, my best a uh, business book is Jack Wells, Straight from the Gut. Here it could be Nelson Mandela, Long Road to Freedom. My favorite drink is gin and tonic. And here the person may say, no whipped cream, caramel, skinny macchiato. <laughs> then you could go on to add other stuff, right? I have 22 suits because I dress for success. I have 22 sneakers because I dress for comfort. So all this shows that there's a clear differential. And as we look at the differential, the thing that stands out for us is, ah, the entire dynamic of leadership is changing because what we are, what we are starting to see, and as we I speak to our millennials and as we speak to the folks who are in that generation, the first thing is you're used to a command and control model. And here you're saying it's connect and inspire. Second, you're saying it's all about expertise, and here you talk about innovation at all levels. And that's why, you know, the question is, is it even appropriate for us to talk about senior leadership, middle management, and junior managers? Innovation at all levels is what we are talking about in the new generation. The third one is, okay, I'm here for money. I'm not being very generous here, but I'm here for mission and meaning. Mission and meaning. You can retain me through loyalty, 
You can retain me through inspiration. We actually had a group of people said, don't try and retain me, inspire me. Then I will stay with the company. Then you look at the whole thing. This is ground changing, right? You also then add on to the fact that um, here it's an I and here is a we. Here you compete to engender successful teams. Here you collaborate to engender successful teams. So the world is shifting as we speak. And how do we reckon with what is the new dimension? While simultaneously recognizing that this is not going away. It's not a horizontal world anymore. It's not a vertical world anymore. It's a T world. You have to, you have to play congruent with both these set of uh, dichotomous, often conflicting requirements. So the big aha for us is as we do this shift, the thing that is changing for us is with all this churn happening, the aha for us is it's not about what we know. It's about how we learn. Second, it's not about experiences only. It's about improvisation in a world that is changing so rapidly, you don't even know what it's all about. Third, um, it's about experiences. The third one is it's about individuals. It's about teams. It's about competencies here. It's about application. Who cares if you're the most talented person in the world? If you don't know how to apply it, it doesn't make a difference to the business effect. It's about application. And here it's about resources. I need resources. And most of us is, in this world talk about resourcefulness, which is different. Now, how do we create an organization that is shifting towards that? That becomes the big question. And one of the things that we have tried to do is figure out what does the new leader look like? And therefore, our concern is how do I build a scaffolding of learning opportunities to construct the algorithm of the next leader? What does the algorithm of the next leader look like? And it starts with the foundation. Here's the foundation. In the foundation, we are saying the person has to have the hunger to win, which includes the person's ability to take risks. Second, the person should have personal and professional integrity and transparency. It's not just good enough to have high degree of integrity. It's important to have a degree of transparency because that's how the world perceives you. Third, it's about accountability. How, how do you own um, the sense of outcome that we need you to have? Uh, it's about account. And the final thing is it's about grit. And grit in our world, as we realize that we did the research, is a combination of capacity, resilience, and perseverance. That's our definition of grit. Now, when we, when we are looking at leadership and talent now, we are saying this is what you come to the table with. This is, the, this is what you, we don't, we are not going to train you. This is what we expect from you when you show up. Now, this interesting thing is across the world. So you really don't have to worry about education, knowledge, because in different parts of the world, you may not have that. So if I go to Africa, if I, ha if I spot people with this, then it's my job, Viv's job, and other people's job to train them up appropriately in the, com in the company. So it's, this is the foundation. It is the entry ticket that we look for. The sec next, after that, we say, all right, while we are looking for this as a go, no go decision, what are the basic traits we are looking for? First is authenticity. Second is uh, the uh, learning, the quality to keep learning. And here we talk about how do we learn, learn from failures at all levels? How do we create an atmosphere where it's OK to learn from your failures? To uh, Dan's point, it's all about making sure that everybody across the organization knows that you will fail. If you, and if you don't fail, you perhaps are not trying hard enough. Third is how do you empower? Because that's what the world is wanting. You, you just cannot command and control 171 countries. Another one is how obsessive and determined you are. This is an important one because we found, and when we did the research on leaders, some of the most groundbreaking leaders are obsessed with the fun, not just passionate. That is yesterday's word. Today's word is obsessive. How obsessive are you in terms of your final outcome? So this is what we are looking for in terms. Then the final one is, are you a giver or a taker? This is the whole um, 
focus around Adam Grant's book, Give or Take. Are you willing to give to the community? Is, the, is your equation more than a transactional one? So these are the things we are looking at in terms of the, uh, the traits. And that's what we unlock. That's, that is something we train for. Then comes beliefs. And we have been working very hard on the beliefs. And the beliefs are, OK, what does it look like in terms of the core beliefs you want everybody in the company to have? First is customer at the center. At the, not just at the end, at the beginning, during, uh, at the end, all the time. Second, lean and speed. How do you stay lean to go fast? Third, adapt. How do you keep adapting and iterating and learning as you go along? Fourth is the team and empowering teams. And the fifth one is, of course, creating the future, not just managing the present. So this is what we believe are fundamental new beliefs that everyone in the company has to possess so that you really make a transformation shift. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in the old. The problem is, every time we set up a structure, all this have a life cycle. Our last set of beliefs was created during the uh, late 2000s because uh, that's when you had the crisis and it became a very conservative company. So we start seeing that even beliefs and values have a life cycle. The final thing is, OK, if you want to be the, the CEO of the company, then you need to have a set of experiences, including have you introduced a new technology? Have you, a, have you been a global resource? Third, have you introduced a new product? And of course, financial acumen and judgment. What I, what's, how have you cultivated your judgment? So this is what we are trying to do at GE in terms of making sure we're building the blocks of leadership going forward so that it fundamentally changes the DNA of the organization. So in many ways, the challenge that we have is not just to develop leaders, it is to actually design them. So with that, uh, I just want to in welcome the panel to join us for this conversation. Thank you. Raghu, that was great. In the history of the kin, we've never had a higher flip chart per minute rate than that. That was great. And I was trying to take notes, but I love the notion of continuous discontinuity. It reminds me of Joseph Schumpeter, the, the great man of economics and innovation. And one of his big ta challenges was to convince his economic colleagues that this notion of finding equilibrium is, is not going to happen. The real world doesn't reach equilibrium. It continues to move, and it only moves faster. It's not about what you know, but about how we learn. And as things change faster, that mu must be the case. So Raghu, if I can invite you to take the seat, and we'll, we'll move the flip charts and invite the panel up. I'm going to let my colleague, Daniel Deermeyer, do some brief introductions. But I've got to tell you, I'm deeply humbled and pleased that this group of panelists is with us. They bring such a great diversity of background to this question of education and inspiration. Uh, and furthermore, I'll say I, I, it's been an honor to serve with Daniel Deermeyer here at Kellogg to get to know him, to have his support with the kin. And it's a big loss to Kellogg that he's moving to the Sh University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy as the dean of that school in a couple months. And we look forward to further collaboration in the future, Daniel. Daniel Deermeyer. Thank you, Rob. So first of all, good afternoon. Good to be with you, and thanks for the panel for joining us. Uh, before we get going with the panel, because uh, Rob, as you mentioned, this is kind of my last kin here as a Kellogg faculty, I just want to express my gratitude for what you've created here over the last 10 years. This is a tremendous, tremendous operation, a tremendous innovation, a tremendous community. I think one of the absolute gems that uh, we have here at Kellogg, just want to thank you for that, and thanks for being a part of it. So, um, we have a distinguished panel, and uh, I think this was mentioned already uh, before, uh, at least twice, I've tried to pay attention, but I think Anna Catalano's uh, comment on the orbits, and uh, as Ken is being one of, the, one of the few places where we kind of reach out of our own orbit and connect with others, and that's where kind of new things emerge. Uh, when you look at kind of great innovations, particularly in science, very often, they really come about at the boundary of disciplines. And um, I think in order, that's really the design behind the panel here. So we're talking about capability building. 
um, in the context of companies, what are the challenges uh, for the future. And so what better than to bring people together from very different perspectives, but all luminaries in their respective fields. So immediately on my right, uh, on your, your left, we have uh, Stephanie Pace Marshall, who is uh, a legend in the world of education, um, most well known probably for her work as president emerita of, and founder of the Illinois Math and Science Academy, but has been involved with a whole variety of educational initiatives and one of the, one of the great leaders in this space. And then immediately to her right uh, is Don Kilburn. Don is the president of Pearson North America and the CEO of Pearson's Learning Solutions. So you're going to get both a corporate perspective but also from, from one of the leaders uh, in the learning space uh, from the corporate side. And then uh, Richard LaRiviere, following um, one seat down on the right. He is, I don't want to say really the new anymore. But he is our current CEO of the, uh, of the Field Museum, arrived here two years ago. Uh, one of the treasures of the city of Chicago, of course. And uh, before he joined Chicago, he was the president of the University of Oregon. So brings both the university and the museum perspective. And then, of course, uh, Rago, who just uh, spent, uh, set the speed record uh, in flip shot <laughs> movement. Um, so you've heard from him already. Uh, the, the guru of executive education and has shared some of his insights as well. I'd like to kick it off with a, a question to the panel um, to get their perspectives really kind of from a broader perspective. And you all bring very different perspectives to the table here. But give us a sense, um, what is it, what are the types of capabilities that are needed? We've heard a couple of ideas already, but I'd like to get your perspective as well. And then, have you seen some particularly exciting ideas around that, something that would help us to understand really what it takes to build uh, innovative leaders for the future at all variety of different ages and at different areas uh, in, uh, in the economy and the communities? Stephanie, you want to kick us off? Um, sure. Uh, I think um, one, of the, one of the capacities or capabilities uh, is capacity to uh, discern patterns so that you can connect them. Uh, naming, getting the dots, synergizing, thinking way beyond. At IMSA, we have sort of a, a phrase, we do not want to ask kids to think outside the box. We want kids to say, box? What's a box? So this notion of uh, innovation, risk, and of course to do that, you have to give kids lots of times. So they can they can engage in those kinds of activities, but I think pattern discernment, and what I would call both and thinking, and and you touched on that. It's not only uh, using one's one's expertise and knowledge, but it's also intuition. It's not only using experimentation, uh, but it's the value of uh, of where your heart is taking you, and that sounds very soft in science, but it's this combination of what we at IMSA call. Uh, habits of mind of the integrative learner, and I would add uh, to that, uh, we call it developing learners that are smart and wise. S, science, M, mathematics, A, arts, technology, wisdom, innovation, and social entrepreneurship. We're trying to develop creative, creative ethical leaders that advance the human condition, and all of that requires very different ways of knowing, and as you said, integrative ways of knowing. Stephanie, can I follow up on that a little bit? So I love that when no. you said, yes, that's my prerogative <laughs> and I'll take it. Uh, you said that uh, box, what's a box? Yeah. I love that. And you spend most of your life um, really with, uh, with children, young adults and so forth. I'm curious, how do you take these messages and these ideas and bring it to somebody who is 30, 35, kind of the population that Regu is dealing with. Is that the same approach? Is it different? Is that going to work? Do you have any thoughts that you can share with us well, on that? I, I do. It's much harder when, when habits of mind have become calcified, which the longer we live, those habits of mind do become calcified. And one of the things that I think is so critical now, and we could put this in all kinds of of rubrics or algorithms, you said, um, is what does it mean to be smart in the 21st century? Smart used to mean uh, this plethora of information. We just were walking encyclopedias. Now it means application. 
and it means uh, uh, potential. We're really looking for potential and very different kinds of ways of thinking and solving problems. There is also a very big difference between a complex problem and a complicated problem. <laughs> We are very good in our reductive linear mindset and paradigm of thinking and organizing many things to think in terms of change and scale for com complicated things. That's much easier than change and scale at complex things because of the interdependencies. So I think we have to immerse people in periods of discomfort, but also the uh, seeing the leaders, but seeing everyone delve into and work with complexity, naming the relationships, looking at the patterns, finding the synergies. Don, different perspectives, similar challenge. You're in the uh, in the information and the learning solutions business. Uh, give us your perspective on the on the theme. Yeah, so our, our business is, is about um, enabling and helping educators advance people's lives through learning, or we also have businesses, uh, mostly international, that have direct education where we're, we're helping learners advance their lives. And I think one of the most interesting um, journeys we've embarked on in the last uh, couple of years is um, uh, we began to ask ourselves, what does that mean? What does it mean to actually enable someone to advance their life through learning? How do we, you know, can we measure that? Can we begin to actually measure that outcome? And the company went through some serious soul searching on how we should do that. We um, hired a chief academic uh, advisor, Sir Michael Barber, who was uh, on Tony Blair's uh, staff. And we developed a, um, a process by which we could evaluate all of our products and all of our customer engagements and actually begin to, uh, we call it efficacy, it's not the greatest word, but to actually measure the efficacy or the effectiveness of the engagement of the products that we were creating. And we've embarked upon embedding that in every one of our product development processes and every engagement we have. But we've also done, we've also done it in a manner that, because um, we can have a lot of hubris about this, and so we've, we call it things like the incomplete guide to efficacy. We're on a journey to efficacy. We are working with our educational partners to actually figure out what efficacy really is. Because we do think at the end of the day that um, measurable outcomes is going to be um, increasingly important if we want to be able to justify what we do, um, both to learners but also the marketplace. So that's been a big impetus in the last couple of years. The, the other thing I would add to that is the, the advent of digital technologies in particular has made that really possible in ways that it was not possible before so that we can begin to now, and I'll give you a personal example. Um, I have a 14-year-old, uh, class size might be 27, 28. Um, there's a bell-shaped curve in, in terms of attributes and performance. My kid's over here, right? And so to get attention for that, it's very difficult, but through the use of technology, you can begin to personalize learning back to help that kid or the kid at the other end and actually you know, give them a personalized learning path that would really help them in special ways. And you can also gather information and data about that that will allow you to continuously improve that process as you go along. Thank you, Don. Now, Richard, you bring the perspective of somebody, I would say, at the intersection of education and research, uh, first at the University of Oregon. And for those of you that don't know this, the uh, Field Museum is not only one of our greatest museums, but is a very active research environment uh, for marine biology to anthropology and so forth. Give us your perspective. Um, on the theme in general, but I'd also love to, love to connect with some of the themes that Stephanie has brought up already. Um, you interact with a lot of young minds, uh, uh, some maybe still young at heart, and how, what's the role of, uh, of your particular organization in this whole process? Well, one of, the, um, one of the recurring themes that has been subtly woven through, I think, every speaker uh, this afternoon <clears throat> is a, a need to step back and figure out why the hell you're doing what you're doing. And um, this can be a really intense uh, challenge to some people and other people just respond to it with such enthusiasm and, and intuitive grasp of the, of the question. This is one of the big differentiators for me. Uh, if people say, I, I, don't, don't bother me with that, um, <laughs> they go really low on the Christmas card list. 
those people who just want to tell you why they're there and what it is that animates them, even if you think it's dead wrong, you know you've got somebody who's passionate about what, they, what they're doing. At the museum, one of the things, uh, as, as Daniel said, I'm relatively new at the museum. I've been there 19 months. One of the things that is absolutely wonderful about the place is the passion that people bring to their jobs there. Every person you talk to loves the place and is enthusiastic about it. But what we haven't done very well, both in the museum and in my experience in higher education in general, is step back and said, where are we in this, in this continuum of change that we're experiencing in society? And how do we fit into it? So we've got a, an institution that not only studies dinosaurs, but sort of adopts <laughs> certain attitudes of dinosaurs towards the... <laughs> we are the sage on the stage. If you want to know something about dinosaurs, about beavers, about algae, you come to the museum and we'll tell you. Well, I've got news for you. This will tell you, will answer every single one of your questions. And it will do so more quickly and perhaps more authoritatively. And so where does that leave the museum? And those people who have asked themselves over and over again, why are we here, and continue to ask themselves why are we here, are the ones who have, in my experience, have been the most creative in chomping at the bit for change. And so we now have to ask ourselves, do we simply answer people's questions? or do we provide them with an opportunity for them to come up with their own questions? And that's the real key to successful education, in my view. Richard, can you like uh, share an example of that or something that, that makes that come alive? This kind of self-reflection, what that means for the future of the museum, what does it mean concretely? Um, uh, uh, y yes, uh, <laughs> uh, we have Sue, uh, for those of you who are from Another planet, Sue, is, the, <laughs> is the, the largest, most complete Tyrannosaurus rex ever discovered and also the most expensive fossil ever purchased. It's the iconic uh, 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 element of the museum. People come to see Sue. They know that Sue is the biggest. They can look at Wikipedia to, to uh, get all of the details, the number of bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera but they come to be in the presence of that object. And as administrators of a museum, we have to recognize that they are bringing their own personal emotional response to the presence of that object. There isn't a person in this room who has not seen the Mona Lisa. But there isn't a person in this room who would go to the, ever go to the Louvre and not take darshan, visit the Mona Lisa. And there's something about that personal interaction with the, with the source, with the object, with the, with the reality of this scientific inquiry that is absolutely magical. And that is far, far more important than anything we can say about it. But for those of us who are in the business of deciding what we should be saying to the public, that can be a humiliating and, and humbling experience to realize that they're more interested in seeing the fossil than in hearing what we have to say about it. Thank you. Raghu, we think, I think I have a, uh, an understanding that I've never had before, how you think about leadership and how you think particularly about moving from one leadership model to another. I was thinking that the drink of choice for like the 29 years is Red Bull, not, not <laughs> Starbucks. That was the only thing. <laughs> Where I, you're right. Who, who knows? Who knows? Right. So, um, but I would love to hear a little bit about how do you actually make this actionable and concrete? Yeah. What are some of the things of kind of moving from A to B, from where we are now, where we need to be? Give give us something yeah. that you do so, concretely. Uh, let me talk about beliefs, right? Because that is yes. pervasive in terms of what we are trying to do. Customer at the center of everything. Go lean to go fast. Adapt empower teams, we are going to make that a part of our performance metric. So our performance metric consists of two dimensions. One is the KPIs, which is all the indicators, the key metrics. The second one is on values and beliefs. 
Now, the new beliefs are going to replace the old. And therefore, people will be measured on whether they are looking at uh, meeting those beliefs adequately or not. So that automatically triggers a push. Now, first year, second year, you need to make sure that you uh, are a little soft in terms of how you push it across. But over the next two, three years, you want it to be ingrained in the system. And the way we do that is use every leader in the company, the top 5,000 people, to have dialogues with the employees about what the new beliefs are and how they are important and make sure that they know that they're going to get measured. So one, one way of actioning them is to measure them. Now, is it uh, very formulaic? No, it cannot be because these are soft stuff. But it's directionally very important for us to move the entire juggernaut that we have in an appropriate direction. So that is one example I can give you. Great. So I think uh, maybe all of you hinted at it at some point or another. Two of you talked about it explicitly. Uh, let's talk about the role of technology a little bit. And I think that everybody who works uh, in, the in the education space, uh, even remotely, is thinking about it, is worried about it, maybe thinking about it as a threat or as an opportunity. Don, give us your view first, and then whoever would like to jump in I'd love to hear from the other perspectives as well. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think technology is going to be a great, great enabler going forward. I mean, I, you know, whether it be in K, K-12 or in higher education, uh, whether it be in the advent of online programs, and let me speak about that for a second. I mean, technology has essentially enabled students who didn't have access to education before because they were a working adult. They, you know, they came home, put the kids to bed, it's 10 p.m. they wanted to study, and they couldn't actually you know, go to a campus-based program. Now technology enables them to actually get a degree or increasingly a, co a career competency that will allow them to advance their life in their career. Um, that's a great benefit to many people who could not avail themselves to education in, 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 in the past. And I, and I think you're going to see more of that. You've seen quite a bit of that and quite a bit of uptake in that uh, in the last five years. You know, I think the same, you know, can be said for, um, for K through 12, whether it be uh, the use of technology for personalizing education or the use, um, right now there's a, a fairly substantial um, virtual charter school movement um, uh, and homeschooling movement where kids are at home taking courses via technology. So I think it's enabling all sorts of access that you wouldn't have had normally. And then the final thing is on, on the performance side, I think technology is going to enable you to actually begin to track performance in special ways. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, we have a, t a, technolo a physics product that's on a, a technology-enabled. We thought Chapter 4 was great, and the results came back from student performance. It was not so great. It was, in fact, it was poor. And it was, it was happening, we, we just read it at the wrong level. And we had to make some adjustments, and we got much better performance. So that's the kind of continuous improvements you can have when you utilize technology. Uh, um, I, I guess I call it a more nuanced, more um, uh, view of technology, and I struggle with this all the time, coming from an institute or creating an institution where uh, the co-founder of U Google, uh, Google and YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, sold to Google, um, are early founders of PayPal and Netscape and Mosaic and Apache. I mean, this is an institution that that helps kids develop astonishing technology. And I watch uh, what technology can do relative to access and equity and personalization. And we have, we start things at six o'clock in the morning on our technology platform called Cool Hub, which was named by the kids so they can work with a team in China and in Virginia on a very significant science project. So there is astonishing things that technology can afford. Uh, I also know that um, there are cognitive costs be because uh, the cog from a cognitive perspective, a malleable brain and, and a construct, as you all know, of self-directed neuroplasticity, which is thinking actually changes the cortical structure of the brain and its function, we have to be extraordinarily mindful uh, as designers of learning environments, I'm talking more about kids than I am adults, that this technology is changing our brains. And do we recognize that it fosters things like short-term time horizons, 
like potential for shallow learning over deep, deep engagement, like continuous partial attention. So I think there are some enormous advantages and great strides that technology will make in terms of the things that were just talked about. But we have to be very mindful uh, that it's not just an instrument. It is a significant rewiring of this amazing three-pound thing we have in our brain, in our heads. And we have to be very conscious of what it's doing so that we can make choices. Because the kind of, it's not really now about what kids are learning, it's really how they're learning. And how we ask them to learn has profound implications for cognition and cognitive development. At the University of Texas, where I spent my, uh, most of my uh, formative years as an academic, <clears throat> there was one building that had uh, an array of seats sort of like this, and above the podium area, there was this beautiful arched inset into the, into the wall. And uh, people speculated what this must have been for, were these Catholic icons, what the hell was, went in there. When these buildings were built in the 50s, they were for television sets. <laughs> Why? Because television sets were going to replace faculty, they were going to en enable us to teach hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously across the globe, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't turn out that way. And uh, when I see the, the noise around MOOCs, for example, um, I'm amused by it because if you look at the, at the actual completion data around MOOCs, it's minuscule. Lots of people sign up because in the same way that we all start diets and swear we're going to change aspects of our lives and then go right back to what we were doing, we sign up for a MOOC and then do nothing. And we feel good because we really signed up for that statistics course. Right after we paid for the gym fee, right? Exactly, right. exactly yeah. right, yes. Membership. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I, I think that Stephanie is exactly right, that, that there is a democratization element to technology that makes things available to us. But as a substitute for the kind of really hard work that is the development of an individual leader, and it is hard work, that really can't be turned over to a machine or to, a, to an app. It's got to be done really on, on a retail one-to-one -one basis. Uh, I have a slightly different view, and for me, it's a tool. And it's, it allows me to look at the fact that I could perhaps bring about 40,000 employees to the classroom. Now I can take technology and have access to 330,000 employees. But it comes with some caveats. The three things we are looking at is, it's all about compelling content in short time spans. You cannot have it more than 10 minutes. That resonates with emp employees. Second is instant testing. And third is creating forums for practice. Because you can take the learning to them if they don't put it into practice, how do you make sure that they learned, really? So if we have a team now dedicated to um, online digital learning, and we are wallowing through how do we navigate our way and make sure that we create compelling content, instant uh, testing, and communities of practice, and follow through so that you can close loop on the learning people have had. Our experiences, it's easier to do it on skills and more difficult to do it on stuff like leadership. So we're still working our way through. Wonderful. But it's exploding. This world is exploding right yeah. now. If I may just, you know, just a follow-up question on that, and whoever wants to comment on that, jump, jump right in. See, one of the things when I look at the, uh, the kind of role of technology in the learning space, I think a lot of the arguments are driven by cost, lowering cost, Scaling, the MOOCs, of course, is a great example of that. And now, Rob, I feel a little bit bad that scaling is just one of the things I'm talking about, but I'll, I'll say some nice things about it later. And then the third, I, the third idea is really kind of customization, is that you're able to kind of customize something. That this is a great way to think about a classroom of one, right? And that's great, and it helps us. And, but in some sense, I think there's always, there's always a sense like, well, if we only could bring people in a room and have the kind of personal learning, that would even be better, but we can't, and that's why we need technology for. And something that I'm wondering is really whether there's a role for technology to create learning experience that we couldn't create in any other way. Hmm. And I'll just give you one example, a little, you know, 
10 second personal anecdote. So my sons and I, we learned how to sail two years ago. Not very well, but we tried. So we took a standard sailing class, and how do you do that? You spend three hours in a classroom with a whiteboard, and then you go out on the boat. And the classroom hours are the most painful thing you ever go through. Because the first thing your instructor is talking about is Bernoulli's principle, okay, with the sail and all of that, and you're thinking, do I really need to know this? I want to make sure I can get the boat moving, right? Which should be hands-on, visual, trying something out, almost more like a video game or flight simulator than, uh, to, than to use a flip chart there. So I'm wondering, is there a role for technology to create learning experience that we are, haven't even imagined at this point that really go beyond what we have done in our typical development um, tools that we have at our disposal? Anything that you've seen that excites you? I, I, I think your, your example is a, is a really good one. And this is why MOOCs are failing. Because what MOOCs are trying to recreate is this experience with an individual standing not in front of these people and looking at them and watching them either shake their heads or fall asleep, but in front of a camera. And you lose the, the immediate human interaction, but you've tried to recreate this experience artificially with technology. I see this as, as an example of the immaturity of our ability to harness these remarkable tools for real, meaningful educational purposes. Yeah, I'd, I'd make just a couple of quick points. I mean, I, I referenced earlier the working adult, and I think one thing to keep in mind is the, the new college student, the new average normal college student, it's probably not an 18 to 22 year old living on campus. It's probably a working adult yes. um, who doesn't necessarily have the time to actually be somewhere. Secondly, I, I, you know, if you look at, uh, for example, the US military, US military using gaming technology right now to, to actually educate um, med tech in a battlefield um, because they don't really want to recreate that battlefield. They actually have a, a simulation around that and they can pretty much measure through the performance, how they're going to do in the battlefield. So I think there are some. I think I think the point is well taken that we've got to be very concerned about plasticity around children. We've got to also figure out how we integrate the, the personal with technology. Frankly, another data point is that you know all the technology we put in the classroom probably hasn't improved student performance in the last 30 years, but matched with the appropriate content and learning and pedagogy, it, it will and it, and it is measurably can. But but we've got to be very careful about that as well. I think, I think part of it is that we don't start with the technology. We need to start with, as we've said in every panel, uh, what's our purpose? What are we trying to do? Uh, purpose, me, if, we, if we value uh, children finding purpose, children finding um, not, not, not smart from a DNA perspective, because that's a very old paradigm and a fixed mindset that people are saying, forget, it, forget that. It's not if we're smart, it's how each of us are smart. And that's a very different shift. And those are very different kinds of behaviors. And so if we're trying to create environments for purpose and meaning and freedom and autonomy and, and contribution, and you mentioned uh, learning communities, if we're trying to create more collaborative work environments, more conditions that will encourage interaction and experience and innovation, then how might technology serve as a vehicle to enable that to happen? MOOCs were, were destined to fail because they started from a wrong premise. They are automating an old paradigm. Why would you want to automate an old paradigm? We're talking about something fundamentally very different. So let's ground ourselves in the kinds of learning that we want to develop among learners of all ages and then say, what do we know about technology that can really advance that? Gaming is a very great example, as is the capacity for global collaboration. When I see my kids talking to kids from China who are, in or, who are sending research to, to, to Virginia because the lab is there and then the Chinese will analyze it and get back to IMSA kids because they're the most innovative thinkers, that's something that could not happen without technology. But it's around the right kind of learning. And I think the work that is happening now in terms of mindset and thinking, you know, Einstein had it right in the beginning that the problems we have now are not going to be solved with the kind of thinking that we brought to it in the, in the first place. My concern as an educator is the, is the enormous gap 
between the kinds of learning experiences most children have in most places called schools and the kind of innovative environments we have been talking about here. There is a huge gap. Reductive, anal retentive thinking in schooling is not going to get us to the generative and life-affirming and transformational kinds of innovative thinking that we're talking about. So while the Red Bull or the Starbucks or whatever generation, <laughs> when they get is, is pushing the envelope, they are. The little people are still being given standardized test scores in kindergarten. There's something really wrong with this picture. There is, there is some would say, a fundamental crisis by the time we get to high school around college, college readiness and career readiness. And if you look at inner city schools where 25 percent are graduating, when you look at community colleges where 50, 60 percent have to take remedial education to get into college, to get, be ready for college. This is reading, writing, arithmetic kind of stuff. You know, it, it denotes a, a national issue in some ways. The only point I would make is connectedness does not mean relatedness. Yeah. And the, when we look at technology and use, use of uh, te digital technology for learning, if we miss out the relatedness portion of it, then I think the connectedness alone is not going to be sufficient. So um, how do we um, ensure that people relate first and then use it for connections later on works very well. If you bring people first, Make sure that they know each other a little bit and then use technology as a supplement to what you have learned face to face. You can actually um, really accelerate learning a lot more aggressively. So, so far what we have seen and we're trying to look at other options as well, where we have used technology as a supplement and an enhancement and not a substitute to learning that we've already had, I think it pays off. But an independent way of using technology just for people to learn, I'm not sure whether we have seen it be successful yet. I'm not saying I'm giving up hope. I think it'll be great if we do that, but we haven't seen that happen yet. Where, where I, what, what you spurred in my thinking with, with that comment is uh, empathy. Uh, a lot of people talk about resilience, but empathy is becoming such a fundamental um, not not a skill, but a but a habit of mind and a state of thinking. And is there a role for technology in empathy? Because that's that's the the question. I mean, what is it that we're trying to develop, and is there a role for technology? And there is a profound difference between connectedness and relatedness. And so, uh, I'm I'm personally holding the question of how do we create environments that enable us to really listen and hear one another and, and develop that capacity for empathy. So I want to give the audience at least uh, a couple of opportunities to ask some questions. Now remember, there are two prerequisites to participate in KIN. You have to be able to read and you have to have a loud voice. So let's start over there. Yes. Beautiful. So, uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I, I divide books into, into narratives, fiction and nonfiction. That's storytelling, right? And you can argue about whether that's going to be all online or whether that's going to be analog and print. You know, that's, but that's fine. That narrative, I think, will stay. Um, maybe. Um, and then on the other side, I think we have textbooks, which are really proxi proxies for courses in a sense. And I think right now what you, the first steps you see is analog textbooks going online, right? So that's radio shows on TV, right? Now we're beginning to realize that the medium's interactive and that we'll be able to actually have assessments for learning and remediate online and have chat and group. And you're going to see the next generation, I think, of learning of, of, of textbooks essentially online, which will be interactive courses. Literacy. And what will literacy be? How will children learn when, when they have become accustomed to 
Well, let's hope reading doesn't go away. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm somewhat a Luddite, so for me, book is soup. I need to be in the presence of a book, and it's, it's part of that relatedness. I don't think books are going to go away. I mean, there are some things that, because it's information, you can pull it out as, as Richard did from his, from his pocket. But um, we have a different relationship, I think, with books. Let's have one more. Yes. Um, the gift of failure is inherent in learning, and yet it's an anathema to business people. Now, how do you express in building your learning environments in corporate education where you embrace that environment? Which um, I'm not, I don't want to make comment, but I, I'll let you finish it. It's a so, tough one. Honestly, for business leaders to admit failure. Repeat the question, yes. The, the question the, was, the gift. I'll repeat, hang on for ahead. just a second. I'll just repeat the question. Uh, so the question was about failure and the role of failure in learning, which is a very it's a key component when you learn throughout your life. But now, how do you maintain that role when you're educating business leaders? Sorry, Virgo. Yeah. So it's a tough one. The, um, we, we are caught in that. And our struggle is that as an organization, we want to be number one or number two. We want to be perfect. And that's the DNA most of our leaders are used to. And for them, for now, you to suddenly say it's okay for you to fail, they don't believe you. So then the whole thing is how do you include that as part of the culture? And how do you train people for that? That's why when we are now looking at our new beliefs, we are actually saying we, 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 we stay lean, we fail fast and learn. And as part of one of the anchors of our beliefs, saying we fail fast and learn. So um, I do think that um, the way you measure people, the way you um, reflect on failures, the way the leaders expose the theory of how do we learn from failures and celebrate them um, becomes very critical in this dimension. We are far from being perfect in that dimension. We are still starting to figure out what that means. Which leader will have the courage to go out in the open and say, I screwed up? Right? And we're starting to see some leaders do that, and that really pulls up their authenticity sky high. And when that happens, the people down the line realize it's okay. So, but we don't have too many of those. Yeah, so. very, very often the, the reality of the situation is, is when the leader comes in and says, I screwed up, everybody says, oh, this is a genuine person. But then the sense in the audience is, it's okay for him to screw up or her to screw up, but boy, I better not. You bet. And how you how you you really genuinely embrace someone else's failure is often the real revelation. So, it's rare that uh, you serve on a panel where not only you, is it an enjoyable conversation, but you learn something. And now this is actually a panel on learning and education. And here we are, uh, learning from each other. Um, I certainly have learned a lot. I've learned about. Everything from the classroom of one to designing new leaders. I've heard about uh, self-directed plasticity. Did I get that right? And box, what's a box? I've heard about the power of metrics and feedback, particularly when we're thinking about whether this, the type of materials and the learning products we create really have efficacy. And then uh, one of my favorite insights today is the power of presence, of the presence of the object, of the painting, and the presence of uh, being in a room uh, with such great uh, individuals, with great thinkers together, and spending some time together to think uh, outside of the box and even forgetting that there's one in the first place. Rob, thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to the panel. Um, some, uh, some really poignant things. Stephanie gave us a few things to think about, some cautionary tones. We often hear how great technology is, but there is an ugly underside. But every panel has talked about taking the old paradigm and applying it to the new. We do this over and over again. We're doing it, for instance, with electric vehicles right now. What is the big problem people have with electric vehicles? We have a medical term for it. It's called range anxiety, which means they think they're going to run out of power in the middle of the Mojave Desert and die because there's no petrol station nearby which means they've taken the old paradigm and said, oh my gosh, this thing takes three hours to charge, so I'm going to drive into a petrol station, plug it in, and read a magazine for three hours? How's that going to work? So when I confront this 
orthodoxy, something we believe about the world which must be, which doesn't violate the laws of physics to do something else, this orthodoxy, I say, how many of you have a garage? And all the hands go up. How many of you have an outlet in your garage? And the hands go up. And I say, how many of you sleep? Who cares if it takes six hours to charge the damn thing? You're, you're going to sleep for five and a half hours and it'll be charged the next morning. If you're a cross-country trucker, don't buy a Tesla. <laughs> and by the way, the technology will rapidly get a lot better where this notion of range anxiety, will, we will be laughing. A number of the panelists mentioned this, that TV was just radio shows on TV at the beginning. And Richard, you, you mentioned help people find their own questions. I think there's no greater role for an educator than helping people find their own questions and give them the tools to address those questions. We're going to come back to that a little bit later.